So what you're seeing here is the readme file from programming assignment number one for this course. And it's, it's intentionally designed to be very simple. It's really designed to help you understand, kind of reacquaint you with programming with C++. Hopefully you haven't forgot everything you learned in 2201. It's also there to help you understand your programming environment and tools, which will again, hopefully be familiar to you. And it'll also do a little bit of recap on some software design concepts. If you're familiar with C++, if you did well in 2201, you should have no problem with this assignment. If you find yourself absolutely struggling with this and you can't get anything to work, please send me an email and let's talk because you may not be prepared for the class yet. So there's several files I'm giving you here, uh, including the files allocationtracker.h and all allocationtracker.cpp, and then a bunch of test files and so on. And then there's also some files that are kind of build project related files that you shouldn't mess with. They're there to make sure things build correctly. And the main thing you're going to do is you're going to implement the simple array.cpp file. And you're going to have to like, you know, literally make an instance of that file because there isn't one there yet. So if you, if you download this thing and try to build it, it'll yell at you and say, hey, where's the, where's the uh, simple array.cpp file? And the answer is you've got to make one. And so what you're going to have to do is figure out how to implement the methods in that file using C++ syntax, which we'll start talking about tomorrow. And I've given you the header files, so you know what methods you have to implement, and then you have to implement them, and you have to figure out what they're supposed to do. And then you have to run them against the tests that are over in the test folder. And the way you'll do that is when you run it, you can set it up and then it'll go ahead and run, and it'll, it'll yell at you if your tests fail, and if your tests pass, you get a nice little green check mark saying you, everything worked. Um, so part of the goal is also to figure out what the methods do. And, and this is really just to incentivize you to read through the tests and see what the tests are actually doing. So we're going to take a little time to look through that stuff. Now, what you're supposed to do here is you're supposed to take this code, clone it from my repository, add in the simple array.cpp file, add in the implementations there, comment it, get it all working, and then submit it for my review. And like I said, I'll send out a Google form that will have you fill in the information you need to be successful. Please do not send me the assignment through email. Uh, we'll ignore that. You have to do it through the repository, which is just good practice. It's very good practice to learn how to use uh, GitHub or GitLab or Git in general for your code. And uh, I will also give you comments through this mechanism as well. The undergrads, if, if you're taking the course for undergrad credit, you just have to implement the simple array class. Don't implement the functions as inline because it's a separate compilation model. And then work through the tests in simple array test, this file over here, and figure out what the class is supposed to do. The, the documentation of the methods are, are intentionally vague so that you have to reverse engineer them by reading the tests. So it's, it's good practice for reverse engineering behavior from tests. And uh, then there's also some tests that you can run to see if your code is incorrect as well. And then the grad students have to um, write some additional tests, six additional sets of functional tests. And so that would be a way, if, if you're taking the class for grad credit, I'm not sure if anybody actually is, um, contact me and we'll talk more about that. Here's some things to think about. Make sure you put your email address and your name and your VNet ID and that you understand the honor code at the beginning of every file that you're implementing. And uh, that's just standard practice in classes to make sure you remember that you're under the honor code. Don't modify the project files, please. If you do, crazy stuff will happen and I won't know what to do to help you. Um, and then make sure you use the, C, the CS3251 coding standards you'll lose points if you don't. Make sure that you use Clang as the compiler. And if you look at the instructions on the website for installing the software, it gives you a link to, to go figure out how to install your software. Very important to get that to work, otherwise things won't work properly. Okay, um, so I think hopefully this all makes sense. Let's go ahead and take a look at the code. So here is simple array.h. This is the header file. And you can see that it has a little header file inclusion guard. That's a pattern that we'll talk about. You'll see that in all our header files to make sure that 
we don't accidentally include this file more than once. We are going to input this allocation tracker header file. And the main thing this is going to do is it's going to keep track of the number of times you allocate elements and delete elements to make sure that they match up. And you can see it does that by having a counter, which is a static field, static data member, as they call it in C++. And every time the constructor is called or the copy constructor is called, we increment the count by one. And whenever the destructor is called, we decrement the count by one. And when we're all done, we should have a count of zero because we want the constructors and destructors to all match up in a seamless, fully nested way. Um, then we also have some other things in here. When operator new is called, then it allocates something with the global operator new. When operator new on an array is called, it, uh, uh, operator delete is called on an array, it deletes. So the point of this is to make sure that you're calling new and delete that work with arrays. And it turns out that that's different from new and delete in C++ that works on individual objects. If you make a mistake and try to allocate an individual object by using the individual object allocation syntax, then an exception will be thrown or uh, the program will exit. So these are ways of getting your attention that you've done something wrong. So the key point of this is when you do your allocations and deallocations in your simple array class, make sure you use the syntax that will work on arrays, not on individual objects. And then there's a method called get count that returns the count, and the count should be zero if you've done your code correctly. Okay, so that's allocation tracker. That implementation is provided for you, and then there's a the C++ insertion operator that inserts the contents of the allocation tracker into an O stream, basically just getting the count, and we use that to do a sanity check. So let's go back over to simple array. You can see that simple array is going to have a constructor and a destructor. And the constructor and the destructor, of course, are used to allocate and remove the, the memory here. And if you go look at the test program, you'll see what it's expecting to see. And we'll look at that in a second. Then we have a couple of accessor methods, including this one that gets the allocation tracker, which is stashed away here in a data member, and also checks to see whether or not it's a null value. We'll see how that gets used in the test programs. There's another map reference, another method called get reference, which is kind of like the subscript operator in C++ that's going to give an index i, and it returns the address of the, uh, not the address, it returns a reference to the underlying element inside the dynamically allocated array of allocation trackers. And it kind of gives some explanation here of why to do this. And then there's a couple methods here that are a little bit more subtle to understand. Once you understand them, you'll go a long way to understanding how some of the cool helper classes or holder classes in STL and C++ standard library work, like unique pointer. And it's this concept called release, reset, and swap. And so swap is easy. We just simply swap the fields in our simple array that's passed as a parameter with what is our left-hand side, so RHS is right-hand side, so we simply swap the, the M array field or data member. Release and reset are a little more subtle, and again, you'll have to look at the test code to see what they do. What release does is it basically gives back the current pointer and then sets the current pointer, the M array pointer, to null, so it releases it. And what reset does is it takes a new allocation tracker pointer it deletes the existing pointer, and then it makes this pointer the new pointer. And that's a little more subtle, and you have to look at the test to really see what it's trying to do. We also forbid copy construction and assignment by putting those methods, those constructors and assignment operators in the private part of the class. And then just for a belt and suspenders approach, I said equals delete, which is a newer feature that's come in later versions of C++ that say, basically, uh, I don't want to allow copying. I don't want to allow assignment. So you just kind of smack someone over the head. If they try to make an instance of this thing and copy it, it's not going to work. OK, so you're going to have to write the method implementations for the mutators and the accessors and the constructor and destructor. Now let's go over and look at the tests. So here are the tests. And the tests are going to give you a better indication of what this code is actually trying to do. Uh, and so here's one test that tests to make sure your destructor is working properly. 
So what we do is we make ourselves a simple array and we expect it not to throw an exception and we give it a dynamically allocated array tracker with 100 elements in it. So of course that's gonna increment that count to 100 and, uh, or to 99. And then when the destructor runs, it should be done properly so that it'll end up re reducing the count the same number of times as it was originally allocated. So you have to make sure you use the right syntax for those things. Um, and then we do some other stuff here. We go ahead and do A1, A2, A3. I think we probably could just do one of these things, but this is just really making sure your code is bulletproof. And when we're all done, we expect the count to be zero because we expect that the constructor of simple array will have incremented this thing every time through and the destructor will go ahead and release it the right number of times as well. Okay, so that's one thing we're gonna be doing here. Um, then down here, we have this thing checking different operations. So we're gonna make ourselves a uh, thing called a direct array, which is just going to be this allocation tracker pointer. And then we're gonna go ahead and make a simple array where we pass that in as a parameter. And then we're gonna to check to see that the get method returns the same result as the dynamically allocated version of direct array, and also that it's non-null. Um, we check get release and swap in order to be able to check how our reset method works and how our swap method works. So this will give you some hints as to far as how that's supposed to behave. And then you can also see the use of uh, release down here. And uh, so there's some cool checking of release and reset and swap. Those were the various mutator methods we talked about. Then we also see reset, which is another thing we test. So again, we're doing things here that involve resetting and uh, it's doing a little torture test of that. And then we also do some tests on our get reference method that checks whether or not we're doing proper subscripting in here and getting the values that we expect. Then finally, there's some other tests that are in here that will check whether or not you get compile time errors in your code. And so I have these commented out because they should all fail. But if you want to see if your code is working properly, you know, you can go ahead and remove them and, and see what the behavior is and so on and so forth. Okay, so those are the methods that you'll have to implement in order to make this work. Again, I don't think this should be very complicated. If you find it, you know, incredibly complicated, let me know. I think the probably the most complicated thing will be getting your compiler set up if you don't have it set up already, and then also learning how to use Git and GitLab in order to be able to pull the code from my repo and then work on it locally and push it to your repo. That's, that's the part that will probably take the longest time if you're not already familiar with that.